you know, I know those things about them. I'm not just 100% relying on whatever they might write into the questionnaire that, that the investors fill out. So that, that's the gray area guide for you know, what we tell our clients. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the Gentle Art of Crushing It show, where we focus on learning and sharing with our listeners all there is to know about how to create success in our lives. This show stands on the shoulders of giants. Our mission is to empower and inspire our listeners to create the life of their dreams whilst having a blast in the process. Let's celebrate life together. Welcome to the show. All right. Welcome back to the Gentle Art of Crushing It podcast, Passive Investing Edition. My name is Randy Smith, and I'm your host today. And I am really excited to have my SEC attorney or one of my SEC attorneys, Matthew Thrasher, with us today. Matthew is the managing partner of Thrasher Law Office based out of Tucson. I think he got a Scottsdale office now, too. But uh, Matthew, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks a lot, Randy. Yeah, we've been working together for, for a couple of years now. So um, yeah, thanks for including me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, why don't we just go ahead and jump in, Matthew? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe the the uh, uh, practice that you have, and maybe why you chose uh, this area of law to practice? Yeah. Um, l- like you said, uh, my law firm's called Thrasher Law Offices. Um, we have uh, offices in, in Tucson and also up in Scottsdale. Um, we're a you know boutique law firm. We specialize in real estate transactions, commercial finance transactions, and SEC um, private placements. Um, those are the main or the, the only areas I, I guess we work in. Um, yeah, we, I've been I've been practicing for I guess it's been 21 years now. Um, I started out doing securities law straight out of law school for a firm in Houston um, that was more on the public side. Like we had a lot of public. Um, oil and gas clients. So we were doing um, debt and equity offerings uh, more on the, like I said, on the public side. And then I moved back to Arizona um, in 2004 and kind of continued to do more security stuff and also um, expanding into real estate. Um, in Arizona, not as as much of the public securities work. So, you know, over the years, it's been more and more just of the on the private placement side. Um, regulation D offerings and all the different, um, you know, offerings that are kind of under that, but more of a transition into the, the private side instead of a public. Are you interested in real estate investing, but don't know where to get started or think you don't have the time or money? Are you stuck in your W-2 because the golden handcuffs make it hard to walk away? If this sounds like you, check out impactequity.net and schedule some time to talk with the founder, Randy Smith. Randy went from massive income to leaving his W-2 through passive income, and he can help you do the same. www.impactequity.net. I'm always intrigued with, like, how do people end up where they are? Um, And it sounds like you knew from an an early age and right out of law school that you wanted to to practice in this space. So that that seems unique to me, that uh, people would know so well what they want to do getting out of college. But it's clearly done very well for you. I think that the transaction side is just a lot more interesting to me. And just, I think with my personality, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, uh, I guess, abrasive headbutting person. So I, I like the transactional yeah. nature. You know, you, there are different sides, but at least it feels like everyone's moving towards a common goal as opposed to, you know, litigation where a lot of times it's like the sole job is just to make the other side as miserable as possible. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so sure. I definitely sure. like the collaborative aspect of, transaction practice a lot more. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, let's kind of dig in if we can into, you mentioned um, public versus private placements. Can you share just at a high level what the difference between the two are and what that might uh, infer for the different types of requirements that you might have? Yeah. Yeah. So I, they're really like, they're really worlds apart. Um, you know, on the on, when I talk about like on the public side, what I'm talking about is you know, what you read about in the paper, you know, an I, someone's launching an IPO, you know, they're going to be listed on NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. You know, that's one example of public. The other one would just be, you know, a, a company that's already a publicly traded company like, you know, Google or Apple or whoever you want to pick. Um, you know, they obviously still raise money by either issuing additional equity or they might issue bonds or debt. 
Um, so, you know, they have to go through a similar, um, you know, different but similar, you know, registration regime whenever they're doing their own offerings. Um, I mean, the main differences are obviously they're significantly larger. Um, yeah. You know, on the on the public side, you're usually talking about hundreds of millions of dollars being raised as opposed to, you know, millions, uh, you know, five, 10, 20 million. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just the other part of it, it's just even more highly regulated than the private side. Um, you know, you're having to, uh, you know, like on the IPO side, like S1s, you know, you have to submit them to the SEC. They get reviewed by the SEC, commented on, and, you know, you, you might end up going back and forth 20 times with them before kind of a document passes muster. Um, so the, you know, and then on the private placement side, like I said, it's usually smaller numbers and, um, you're not, there's not really inter any interaction or very limited interaction with, with regulators. Um, hmm. it's just kind of more relying on people like me to walk you through whatever the check the box regulations are to make sure your offerings, you know, compliant with, um, you know, regulation D or one of the other private placement exemptions. Um, so the, I would say like the, the size of the offering and just kind of the, um, you know, the regulatory scheme is is the two biggest differences between the public and private space. Got it. Got it. Okay. And, and so that, I mean, it makes a lot of sense that somebody working in this space, specifically multifamily or um, some type of syndication model, whether it be multifamily or self-storage or development, whatever that might be, it makes sense to play in this space because it's not, we're not talking hundreds of millions of dollars. These are generally in the millions and um, much more personal, much more hands-on where you're working with the operators and the, the end investors. So uh, I know there's a number of different types of exemptions. You mentioned Regulation D, but we hear a lot about 506C and 506B. Can you share kind of at a high level what the difference between the two are and why that might be important for the new or newer passive investor to know the difference? Yeah, so so Regulation D is a whole bunch of different private placement exemptions. Um, you know, like Regulation D kind of, I guess, sits at the top and then things like Rule 506B, Rule 506C would kind of be underneath it. Um, yeah, Rule the 506B and 506C um, are, at least in my practice, like by far the most common offering exemptions that um, issuers try to or, or syndicators want to utilize. Um, the main the main differences between the between the two um, on the I guess the, the thing that's common is that they both allow you to raise an unlimited amount of money. So, you know, if you you know, if someone wanted to, I mean, you could go out and raise one hundred million dollars, five hundred million dollars still utilizing, um, you know, Regulation D or Rule 506 B. Um, so that's still possible. Uh, but the, the main differences are going to be on the 506 B side. Um, you're not allowed to use general solicitation to find investors. So what that means is you're a more limited um, in, in terms of raising money from people that are, you know, already in your network, um, more or less. Uh, you are, and then also on 506B, you are allowed to have uh, up to 35 non-accredited investors. Um, we always encourage clients to, you know, try to limit their offerings to accredited investors, but uh, on the 506B side, there is a little bit of wiggle room. Um, if you do have like a group or, or a, a few unaccredited investors, um, on the 506C side, you are allowed to use general solicitation. So, you know, you're able to cast a much wider net in terms of, um, who you're raising money from. Uh, the downside to that is that 506C requires the issuer to verify the accreditation status of all of their investors. Um, and also all the investors do have to be accredited. So you don't have that 35 um, gap of, the, the, uh, of non-accredited and people that could sure. invest. Um, so those are the main differences. Uh, you know, 506C, we don't, we usually do 506C offerings for um, syndicators or issuers who have a pretty large um, group of investors and who also have a pretty large or, or pretty broad pipeline of deals um, because of the costs associated with some of the uh, uh, verification of investors. Um, you just usually either have to have like kind of a robust back office team mm -hmm. that can handle that, or you're having to pay money to a third party 
service provider to handle those verifications. Um, so, you know, if, if you're only trying to raise, you know, a couple million bucks from, you know, 20, 30 people, then usually the 506B is going to be the way to go. Um, if you're, like I said, if you're raising from a, a much higher number from a much broader set of investors, or maybe you're trying to raise money for, you know, an entire year's worth of projects, um, mm -hmm. those are more likely to be the 506C. Um, like I said, because it's a bigger number, so they can afford sure. the higher costs. Um, and also, you know, they, they're raising more money, so they need to cast that wider, wider net. Makes sense. Making sense. So I know that you and I, we operate, um, or I've partnered with you and, and some of your partners on 506B offerings. And since we're playing with that, um, that section or exemption, then there's this pre-existing and substantive relationship requirement that comes into play in that. And what I've, you know, I, I will often joke with people, if you line up 10 different SEC attorneys and ask the same question, um, you're going to get 10 different answers on that. But do you have like a kind of a general comfort level on how you define that or, or the advice that you give to your operators to satisfy those and make sure they're in compliance with SEC? Yeah. I mean, the gray area is why we have a job, I guess. So. Yeah. Thank <laughs> so goodness for gray area. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't complain about it too much, but, um, yeah, in, in general, um, you know, we, you know, what we what we advise our clients is they want to try to stay, like I said, within their network as much as as much as possible. So it should be people that you do already, you know, know. It doesn't have to be people that have previously invested money with you, um, but it, it should at a minimum be, you know, maybe people that have signed up for your mailing list and they've been seeing some of your deals that they're getting familiar with you. Um, people that, uh, you know, maybe they haven't invested with you directly, but they've done other private investments um, with other syndicators. Um, those are kind of the people you want to look for um, that, you know, that you, you really want to stay away from um, those kind of like open-ended solicitations that you might see, you know, back in the old days, it was, you know, radio, TV ads, newspaper ads. Now it's much more likely to be LinkedIn posts or, you know, Instagram, yeah. um, you know, podcasts, uh, you know, you really, you want to stay away from that hard ask of saying things like, you know, contact me to invest in my next deal. Here's this project I have contact me to learn, learn about it and learn how to invest. Um, you know, it, it's fine to uh, post things that are, you know, more or less factual in nature, like, hey, we acquired 220 unit property for X and we're hoping to get a, you know, 18% IRR or we just exited a property at a, you know, 2.3X multiple or whatever. That stuff's all, all fine. You just don't want to end it with um, that, like I said, that solicitation of like, you know, ask me how, how you can invest with me. Um, that's when you're getting more into the 506C side. Um, for 506B, like I said, you limited more towards people in your network. It can be referrals from people. Um, if it is a new person, you want to have that kind of cooling off period. Um, you know, ad advice can range from anywhere from like 30 to even I've heard some people say like a 90 day period um, where you're just kind of getting to know that investor, maybe sending them some more information about, about your projects, um, you know, asking them for some, it, you don't have to be asking them for things like send me your W-2s, send me your tax returns, sure. but right. um, at least getting a sense of like, you know, are you going to meet the net worth requirement to be accredited? Have you invested in these deals before? You know, are you comfortable and routinely work with, you know, professional CPAs, professional financial advisors, attorneys, that all of those things kind of get thrown into the bucket of, of making the analysis of, you know, yes, this person's accredited. Yes, this person's sophisticated. And, and yes, I, you know, I have a relationship with this person where, um, you know, I know those things about them. I'm not just 100% relying on whatever they might write into, um, you know, the questionnaire that, that the investors fill out. So, that, that's sure. that. Like I said, that's kind of a the the gray area guide for you know what we tell our clients. Got it. Got it. Okay. And thank you for that. It is um, that's a little more detailed than what I hear from a lot of folks when I ask that question. 
Um, and I know for us at Impact Equity, we've created a policy that I believe I've shared with you that you you signed off on and and said that it met kind of the, the requirements by the SEC. And I think it's important for investors to know that these these requirements do exist. And if you're dealing with operators that are are pitching you and they're outside of your network and they're presenting opportunities to you, it, it's safe to say that those folks might have some challenges with if they got questioned by other attorneys or SEC and just be sure that you're working with folks that, that are really trying to be uh, operate with integrity and follow the rules that exist in this space. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a great way to, to put it. Um, you know, all of our clients, you, you know, you included, um, you know, they're very conscientious. Like I like it when clients ask me questions about, you know, is this general solicitation? Is it okay if I post this? Um, just because I at least know, hey, this person's aware of the rules. They're they're doing their best to abide by them. So um, I always like it when clients ask ask questions like that because it, it means they're, you know, conscientious op- operators. Love it, love it. Well, let's um, if if we can, can we dig into that um, wonderful, light, easy reading document that uh, your organization spends a lot of time working on, the private placement memorandum? Can we talk a little bit about kind of normal things that you'll see, and maybe some things that if you see uh, could be considered watchouts if uh, if investors see those in the PPM? Yeah, um, I, yeah, I always refer to it as the. 100 page document that's filled with reasons to not invest money. <laughs> okay. It's basically, I think you're the guy I'm quoting in when I say that same thing yeah, to my investors. Yeah. yeah it's, it's basically, here's all the reasons you should not give me money and here's all the ways <laughs> that I could potentially lose it. Um, that's, you know, that's really what, what it is. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of guidelines around the PPMs, you know, the, in particular, the SEC, um, especially in the last like 10 years or so, because they have steadily opened up some of these private investment opportunities to more and more investors. Um, you know, either in general, we, re- we really strive to write them in, um, you know, plain English. Um, you don't want the PPM to be overly legalistic. Kind of the SEC's position on it is, you know, this, this should be something that a more or less lay person can like read and understand, understand what their money is going into, um, understand who the people are behind it and, and, um, so, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I think overall, kind of like a high level is just if, if you're reading a PPM that just ha- every other word is, you know, wherefore and, um, you know, whereas that's probably yeah. not a, a well-drafted PPM. Um, you know, uh, there is, there's definitely a lot of boilerplate in them. Uh, you know, I'm not going to lie and, and say that there's not, you know, a lot of the um, tax disclosures, you know, tax laws, they don't change all that often. So a lot of that stuff is just kind of like boilerplate that gets included. Um, You know, I would say the important pieces for an investor, if you're being presented with a PPM, thinking about making an investment, um, you know, that usually the the project description is going to be very important. Um, There should be, uh, there should be either like a table of sources and uses or at least like a couple pages of the document that kind of clearly explain how much money is being raised, what the budget of the project is, where the money is being spent. Um, also, fees are, are a very, very important thing for investors to look at. Uh, the SEC also thinks they're important. Um, so you really want to pay attention to um, what kind of fees is, is this you know, developer or syndicator charging me? How much are they? Um, that should all be disclosed in there. Uh, and then as far as, as far as the risk factors, like I said, the, the laundry list of ways that, you know, your money can get lost. Um, you know, if you're, if you're reading a PPM and all of them are super generic, then, then again, I would say like, that's not a well drafted PPM. Um, you know, like a PPM for a multifamily investment, it should be different from a PPM for, you know, like a self storage uh, project or, or, you know, a retail project. Um, yeah, they shouldn't all just have the same boilerplate risk factors about, you know, COVID or, you know, mar- you know, okay. interest rates can increase. There should be like more specific things either related to the, the market where the project is or specific to the asset class. Um, okay. so I, I would say those are, those are kind of like the things I would look for to be able to figure out, like, is this something that, the syndicator actually like spent time on, or is this just something they like 
you know, more or less cut and pasted off the internet. And, and it's just filled with a whole bunch of like generic um, stuff that could be applicable to like any deal under the sun. Sure. Yeah. And that's kind of an interesting point too. I'm curious when you're working with a new operator, is there, is there like an interview process or do you sit down and kind of discuss the business model and the strategy? And uh, I'm just curious what that, that original PPM development process looks like with a new operator. Um, usually if they're engaging us, um, you know, I'm, I guess I'm fortunate that most of our clients are, are pretty sophisticated people like, like you and some of the syndicators you partner with, like, the, you know, even if they might be raising a fund themselves for the first time, most of them at least come from a background of they've, um, invested their own money into private deals. So sure. maybe they haven't put together their own PPM, um, from start to finish, but they've like seen them, they know what they look like. Um, so we, we usually don't have like a high level conversation of helping them, uh, you know, model, I guess, like kind of pro forma or model out their deals. Um, okay. you know, usually it comes to us and it's already kind of like, um, uh, you know, here's the fees I'm planning on charging. Here's the splits I'm planning on offering, you know, here's the preferred return hurdle I'm planning on offering. Um, usually they already have that in mind. You know, we will obviously look at it if something we see a lot of them. So if something strikes us as wildly out of market, I mean, we will go back to the client uh, on both sides. You know, we'll, sure. we, we'll go back to the client and say like, Hey, this is way too many fees. Like, like, you know, you're, or, or the, uh, the percentage on the fees you're charging, like this is on the high end of the market. You might want to consider reducing it just to make it a more marketable um, deal or on the other side, I'm, you know, we've had clients, you know, where it's like, Hey, uh, you know, all you're charging is a 1% asset management fee. Like, you know, you're leaving money on the table. Like we think you could, sure. if you wanted to, you could charge an acquisition fee. You could charge a refi fee. You could charge a exit fee. Um, yeah. A lot of times investors will say like, Oh, it's my, it's my first raise. I don't want to be too fee heavy. I want to make it palatable to my investors, which is yeah. fine. But you, you know, we do want to point out like, you know, Hey, you can make more money off this deal if you wanted to add in some of these things. Um, yeah. Same thing on like things like preferred return rates and um, uh, promote splits. You know, someone came and said, you know, uh, you know, hey, we're we're going to be doing like a ninety-five five promote split. You know, I would for sure tell them like, well, you think you're leaving money on the table. You know, like sure. market range might be more 80, 20, 70, 30, depending on the type of deal. Or um, hey, that's way too much. Um, you know, you're you're your investors are probably going to be turned off by the fact that you're trying to take, you know, a 60% promote share or whatever it is. Um, sure. But yeah, so we do walk them through that, but we usually don't model it out for them. Usually they're already presenting to us like something. And then if, like I said, if it's out of market, we'll tell them. Got it. Yeah. And I, I think to your point, it's important. Um, yes, we certainly don't want to charge too many fees because we, we need to align the interest of the operator with the investor as well. But on the other side of the coin, I learned firsthand uh, when you mentioned the 95.5, that's actually the model that I did on my very first fund because, again, I wanted to make sure that there was an appetite for my investors. Uh, sure. I, I wasn't, it wasn't as important for me to make a bunch of money on the first couple of deals that I was doing, and I just really wanted to see if it would work. And I found out that there's a reason why you should be charging more because it costs money to run these businesses, and there are fixed costs that if you – if you starve the business, ultimately you're doing a disservice to your investors in the long run because you're not going to be able to provide the resources that are needed to, to have the scalability or the longevity that you need in the business. So Yeah, the, uh, the scalability, I was about to say that. So, I mean, I, you're 100% right. I mean, yeah, you want to be able to, you know, because if you're successful, you're eventually going to, you know, you'll probably want to bring in house some of the bookkeeping or tax accounting stuff. You'll want to bring in house some of the investor relations stuff. So yeah, you need to have room to be able to, to grow and, and be able to offer better service to your investors. Yeah. No, great point. Yeah. And I, th I think there's this, there's a mindset at times where um, people have the scarcity mindset and they're worried about people making money. But I think in any good business and um, relationship, everybody needs to come out of that business relationship with some benefit. Otherwise there's really no reason to do that. So um, I have a tendency when I hear 
people kind of nickel and diming about every single penny that's being spent in the business. Sometimes it's better just to part ways because it's possible they could do they could do a better job um, or they might have the perception they could do a better job with those those dollars in their own pockets. So, um, yeah, thanks for walking through that. I think that's important. And it's not something that I think that is discussed that often. So it's important for investors to know that it's important to do that for sure. Now, on the other side, I've seen some PPMs where I, I look at it and the interest are not aligned. And I'm shocked that there are investors that are willing to pay the fees and to, um, you know, take, so take most of the risk and then have very little to gain on it. So it's, it's good to hear that there's folks like you providing that type of guidance to the operators that might be trying to, to push things through that maybe shouldn't be pushed through. So that's, Oh good. yeah. Yeah. We've seen those. I, I've, we've seen our fair share of, um, you know, PPMs that, that from, you know, other, other groups that'll come in, like a client will ask us to look at it and, it's like, even as a professional reading this, like I can't really <laughs> tell you where your money is going or like how money comes out of this thing. Like it, um, so yeah, yeah there, there definitely are some, some bad ones, I guess, out there. Um, but yeah. Okay. Wait, and I'm curious too, if, if there's a new or newer passive investor that's looking at this space and they see a PPM, is it common for them to come to an attorney like yourself or somebody in your organization or a similar organization to ask to review a PPM and give some advice and counsel on it? Um, I guess I would say, I, I guess for the most part, I would say no. Um, we get very few requests from um, limited partners to like look over a document that they've been presented with, um, particularly if it's, um, you know, what I would call kind of like a, a retail, I guess, investment um, where it's, you know, someone that's putting in, you know, $50,000, $100,000 as part of like a $3 million capital raise. Um, you know, we'll very rarely will we get asked to review those kinds of documents. And when we do, you know, I'll, I'll usually tell tell the the person like, you know, happy to look at this, but, you know, even if I like, think something could be rewritten or something seems a little heavy, like the syndicator's not going to change it. You know, right. like they're, right. they're not, they're not going to go back. And I mean, they're just like, it's like, I can read this and I can go talk to the syndicator and tell them, you know, my investor doesn't like X, Y, Z terms. And they're going to say, well, then this deal's not for you. We'll go get someone else. Sure. Um, sure. So, yeah. So we don't usually get that type of request very often. Uh, it would only be if, you know, if, like if one investor is making up 50, 75% of the capital being raised, then for sure they have leverage to negotiate different terms. But uh, yeah, if it's, if it's like a $5 million capital raise and, you know, it's a bunch of people putting in a hundred thousand bucks each, um, you know, they're not really going to have any leverage to tell a syndicator like, Hey, you need to adjust your asset management fee. I think it's too high. Yeah, just to say no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm sure because you hear that a lot where people uh, people that are coming into the space, maybe they are they are sophisticated, potentially even accredited, but it's the first time they've seen a 100-page document, and it can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, I think just even potentially general legal counsel could look at something and kind of point out if there's something that seems out of line, I suspect. But now, I know when I'm talking with investors, you know, I generally will explain that this – the document is, as you said, it's a hundred ways how this thing can go south, all the negative reasons why you don't want to invest. Um, but at the end of the day, there are protections on both sides as well. Uh, so if a deal goes bad and it's because of, I've, I've heard the term bad actor, or um, maybe uh, maybe there are some challenges with the, the general partnership in a way, are there protections for the passive investor in there? And if so, what do those look like or what should we be looking for? Yeah, there are, there are. So, you know, the whole, you know, the regulation D rule 506 BC regime, it's really set up as, you know, there are safe harbors where basically the SEC has a bunch of rules and they say, you know, impact equity as, as the issuer, if you comply with all of these different um, rules around the offering, then what it does is is it shifts the burden to the investor to that if a deal goes south or if they think they've lost their money they're not happy about it um, that in order to sue you know the issuer or the syndicator um, it, 
the standards much higher. They, they almost have to prove fraud. Um, like, you know, you wouldn't be able to sue someone and, and just say like, well, you know, they lost my money and, um, and I'm just not happy about it. I mean, you would really have to prove almost that, you know, Hey, they lost my money because, you know, Randy has a gambling habit and he, <laughs> you know, w went and spent half a million dollars of the capital raise in Las Vegas or something like that. Um, sure. so it, it makes it, it protects the issuer because it, it it, it makes it more difficult to be sued if, if a deal doesn't work out. Um, that being said, you know, the anti-fraud provisions, which is um, rule 10B5, um, those apply across the board to every single offering. Doesn't matter what, you know, you, there's no waiver of fraud. So, you know, you could increase your PPM from 100 pages to 500 pages. Um, you're still going to be on the hook if you steal investor money. Um, there's yeah. no way to disclose around it. Um, so, yeah, so the investors do still have some some protections of either being able to rescind their investment or pot potentially even get treble damages if um, they're able to prove wrongdoing in, in a failed deal. But like I said, the standard is quite a bit higher. Um, so that's that's kind of the benefit of doing, you know, the 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 entire PPM and private you know offering process. That's kind of what it buys you um, is that. You know the the risk to you if a deal goes south again as long as everything was above board and it's just a bad market or whatever it is um you know you're the issuer is going to be much more protected by for having done the private placement good that and it is a relief to hear though that like that bad actor or fraud clauses are in pace because because that quite often newer investors in this space that's the concern we've we've all seen the ponzi schemes or the you know, the guy run into the Bahamas or wherever with, with people's capital or just raising for something that doesn't even exist. Um, so it, it's good to hear that those are in place. And um, ultimately, there is some protection for the for the investors as well. So now I, I'm curious if we can just spend a few minutes. Um, you've been in the space you mentioned for a number of years and you've seen, uh, I suspect, a handful of cycles. Um, we're in an interesting time in with the economy, with what's going on in the industry and the interest rates, from your perspective, where where are we in the state of the market and what kind of things are you watching closely for the next few years? Um, yeah, I mean, well, you know, definitely, I mean, it, it, it is a weird market. I have seen up and down cycles. I mean, I, I, I was in-house counsel at a mortgage company during the 2008 financial crisis. And, you know, that company went, that company went bankrupt. So uh, wow. I definitely, I definitely have firsthand experience in the up cycles as well as the the down cycles. Um, sure. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I guess if I was good at predicting these things, I'd have, you know, uh, I probably wouldn't be needing to work anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, both. Right. It, it does seem a lot different from now compared to 2008, at least um, from what I see and from, whether it's clients or like banking partners that, you know, we interact with, it doesn't seem like anyone's at least right now is afraid of just kind of like the dropping off a cliff, like it was in 2008. Um, you know, it's kind of all the pressure that at least we're seeing in what we do and, and what our clients do. Um, it has been a hundred percent related to this kind of historic interest rate increase over the last 12 months. Um, that, I mean, that's really what's been driving it. For some of the, you know, um, you know, obviously multifamily has been very popular the last couple of years. So specifically for some of the multifamily, um, it seems like a lot of it's just a function of, you know, rents trail interest rates. So, you know, when interest rates, you know, double in the course of whatever it's been, six, nine, nine or 12 months, um, uh, you know, like rents don't rise that fast. So there's going to be some lag it's going to put stress on on some operators, particularly ones with um, adjustable rate mortgages um, that, you know, their debt service is just increasing quite a bit. And the rents aren't aren't, you know, aren't able to match that increase. Yep. Um, yep. That's kind of like the main stress we're seeing. Uh, and a lot of those loans are going to be coming up for refis in the next anywhere from like six to 12 months. And I think I read an article in the New York Times a few weeks ago, it said, uh, I think it, I think it was 30% of commercial real estate loans are, are coming due um, in like roughly the next 12 months. 
Um, so, I mean, there, there's going to be some stress there so far on like the refinances that we've been working on. Um, uh, you know, banks, they're not in the business of, of taking over and running properties. Like that's not what they want to do. Um, so for the most part, lenders have been working with uh, borrowers as refis are coming up. Um, I, I guess I would say like the most common thing we're seeing right or starting to see right now is uh, just um, syndicators or operators having to do capital calls. Um, so either they're having to like re re leverage, rebalance the loan by bringing in additional mm -hmm. equity um, or uh, uh, they're having to like put out, you know, a lot of money on new interest rate caps. You know, those have kind of gone through the roof. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that that's definitely creating some stress between having to either do capital calls or like member loans. Um, but, you know, I, I guess from the operators and like clients we've been talking to, you know, they it seems like for them right now, it's more of a factor of like all these projects that we thought were maybe going to have like a two to three year horizon are now mm -hmm. getting pushed out to more like four or five years um, yeah. just because they're going to need the rental, the, you know, rents to continue to, to bump up incrementally um, and then combined with potentially having rates get cut here, maybe like a year from now um, so that the market for the sale is a little bit better. Um, we, we don't have any clients right now who have been distressed. Um, like I said, mo most of them are, are just kind of like, yeah, we're, we're going to have to kick this out for another year. You know, we oh, thought maybe we were going to exit in 2023 and now it's not looking like we'll be able to exit until 2024. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And I, I'm wondering, you brought up, um, I think you said member loans and capital calls. Um, can you just define a, a member loan? I suspect I know what that is, but can you share what that is exactly? Or? Um, yeah, usually, um, you know, the documents, whether it's the PPM or, you know, operating agreements, limited partnership agreements, um, usually have different options. If a syndicator or operator needs to bring in additional capital, um, you know, just a pure equity infusion, you know, a capital call, that's one way of doing it. Um, but if a, if a, property is distressed. Um, usually people don't want to throw good money after bad. So sure. that's kind of usually when the member loans come into play. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be distressed, but you know, if a project's just like over budget or something like that, um, kind of the more common way we'll see money come into the deal will be loans either from the principals or from the investors, where instead of just throwing more equity in, that's you know obviously at the end of the distribution chain, you know, yeah. we're willing to put more money in, but it needs to be in front. Um, so that they'll put it in as a member loan where, um, you know, they're usually earning a higher rate of interest. You know, the interest might be anywhere from like seven to even like 12% on the member loans. Uh, yeah. And then that money is going to get returned first when the, when the property is ultimately either like sold or refinanced. So it'll be ahead of that equity. Um, so it just puts them in a little bit more secure position with whatever additional money has to come in. Um, obviously they're still going to be behind the bank loan, but mm -hmm. they'll at least be in that kind of second position, um, ahead of the other equity. And that's kind of yeah. usually the terms you would have to offer up, like I said, to, to get people to want to put more money into, you know, what might end up being a distressed deal. Got it. Got it. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Thanks for walking through that. I thought I had an idea what it was. I was right, but, um, yeah, good detail. Now capital calls though, um, you know, there's this this whole idea of whether they're required or not required. Does it dilute? Um, how do you see those structured generally um, with the PPMs that are coming out of your office? Yeah, generally, I would say generally I what we see in the market is most of the time at the capital calls um, above whatever the initial commitment is are voluntary. Um, the only or alternatively, there might be. Um, we've seen some deals where uh, the issuer is allowed to call additional capital, but it'll be capped at something. So, you know, it might be capped at 10% of whatever your initial investment amount is. Um, you know, the main reason for that is just like, frankly, investors, I mean, they just, they don't want to be on the hook, you know, in mm -hmm. perpetuity for, you know, effectively like an unlimited amount of money. Um, sure. Usually kind of the deal is presented to them as, you know, hey, you're going to give me your check for fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars, and and that's all you're going to be on the hook for. Um, you know, if there's shortfalls or something, um, then either you know sometimes the principals have to come in with that money, 
or at a minimum, it, it could be voluntary. And you can always go and ask for more money from your investors. But you know, if they think a deal is going south, you know, they're able to say no. Um, yeah, I see. I see very, very few to almost zero deals um, where there would be mandatory capital call obligations. Um, like I said, the only ones that we really see that are mandatory, they are even those are capped at some amount. So, you know, if you're committing one hundred thousand dollars, maybe you're actually on the hook for like one hundred and ten or something. Hmm. Um, but I've never seen a deal where it's just um, unlimited that that you know in limited partners would have to just keep feeding in money. Great. Well, this is good. I'm looking looking at our time and, and these always tend to run longer than what I'm hoping. I feel like I could ask another probably 30 minutes to an hour worth of questions, but I guess we'll save that. We'll save that for maybe another day. But um, yeah, I do have a, a few questions I'd like to ask everybody if I can, if uh, we've got the time to jump into those, if that's all right. Sure. Absolutely. Very good. So um, I'm wondering if you have a particular resource or a book or a podcast or something that you refer to folks that are new to the space. I know you mentioned you have a video for fund managers, but are there anything that you might be able to suggest for an investor to try to learn more about this space? Yeah, uh, one of them is um, there's a, a now I'm now I'm blanking on on the name, but there's a. Uh, uh, CPA podcast. Um, I think it's called like the real estate CPAs or something like that. Um, they do a really good job of diving into some of the the tax issues, uh, sure. which can get very complex, you know, between depreciation, um, you know, deficit restoration obligations, um, how some of the different income streams ultimately get treated on, uh, you know, uh, whether it's like operating cash flow. Uh, opposed to you know proceeds from a refinance or proceeds from sale and like tax implications, um, so yeah they they do a really good job on their their podcast of explaining some of the tax details. Um, you know I, don't, I I can't really recommend any uh, can't really re can't really off the top of my head think of any books like specifically related to um, you know limited partner real estate investing. Um, yeah, I can't really think of anything like off the top of my head. The, like I said, the Real Estate CPA podcast is really good. Um, yeah. And then I always think just other books in general, like, um, you know, books like Barbarians at the Gate or, um, hmm. you know, Liar's Poker. You know, those don't deal specifically with real estate, um, okay. but they, they definitely just kind of touch on the overall corporate environment of whether it's like mergers and acquisitions or, you know, bond offerings um, and, and just kind of like in general how – they kind of explain how they work just in a much more interesting narrative way sure. as opposed to like reading something like a textbook about it. So <laughs> sure. Okay. No, I, and I've not heard of either of those. I hear a lot of different books on uh, this podcast and others, but liars poker and barbarian at the uh, barbarians at the gate. I will check both of those out. Thank you. Yeah. They're, they're entertaining books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. All right. Well, let's uh, let's do a couple of fun ones if we can. Um, do you have a recent bucket list item that you've checked off of your list, or one that you're hoping to in the near future? Uh, bucket list item. Um, well, at the beginning of the year, uh, uh, I had a goal of uh, hiking the Grand Canyon in under I think it was under seven hours, um, and I accomplished that. Hiked it in um, I think it was like six hours and forty minutes or something Fantastic. like that. Um, was that. So the, I was kind of it. Was that the rim to rim or the rim to rim to rim? Uh, no, just a rim to rim. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Did, didn't not not all the way down and then back the second time. Um, okay. But yeah, so that was kind of exciting. Otherwise, uh, bucket list items. Um, yeah, I guess that's like well, that was kind of the main one. Trying to just improve my hike time, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I know. I know a number of folks that are in the uh, in that space, and even ultra marathoners and things like that. That's. Uh, what a great accomplishment. Congrats. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And then kind of a fun one here. If uh, extra hundred grand were to land in your bank account today, where would you invest those dollars? Oh, I, I would, I would, um, I, I mean, I, I would put it into, I guess it self, sounds self-serving, but I would for sure put it into, still put it into real estate deals. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, obviously everyone's, everyone's personal, like financial situation is, is different, but, um, you know, I, I just think it offers, you know, great, they all, not always, they offer good returns. 
Um, I think in general, you're going to beat the market. Um, you know, I, I, I invest, uh, you know, you know, I invest in, in clients projects and, um, I, I think the important thing is, you know, I don't try to time anything. I just kind of more or less across all cycles will still allocate money into real estate investments. Um, it. it's not my job to kind of like pick and choose when I think the market's going to take off or when I think it's going to drop off a cliff. Um, yeah. I think you just have to be kind of like steady and leave that to other experts and, and just kind of like steadily keep, keep plugging along. But I, um, I would, I would for sure still put it into real estate deals instead of trying to, you know, pick stocks or, or something like that. Yeah. I love it. So the dollar cost averaging approach of uh, investing in syndications in real estate. I love it. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I think in general, like I, there's been, stu I, mean, I, I mean, I think in general, like um, outside of like technology, um, you know, I think like real estate is kind of like in the top three of um, where people have made either their millions or billions of dollars. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of it, that's a lot of, uh, you know, even when you look at things like professional sports teams, owners, and, you know, they're pretty much all either you know, on the finance side these days, or a lot, you know, a lot of them have real estate backgrounds so that they made their money in, in some type of real estate play one way or another. Yep. They made it or they keep it in real estate, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, great, great answer. And it falls right in line with what, what I share with, with the audience and with my investors as well. So thank you for that. Well, um, any, anything else you'd care to share with the audience or care to share how they could find you if they needed to, uh, potentially your services? Yeah, our website is just a thrasherpllc.com. Um, if, yeah, if you want to visit our website, there's information about all the attorneys on our team, um, you know, a lot of information about uh, transactions we've worked on in the past, what we're working on re re uh, recently. Um, so yeah, I think our website's a great resource. And then um, if anyone, you know, any of your listeners have any questions, you know, my email is just matt, M-A-T-T, at thrasherplc.com. Um, so, you know, always happy to answer emails or set up phone calls if there's questions or something like that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Matt, thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I know this was your your very first podcast uh, showing. I think you did a great job and brought a, a ton of value. So thanks so much for being on the show. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Randy. Yeah. I guess I should have said I would have put the hundred thousand dollars specifically into an impact equity real estate investment. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Maybe go back there and edit go. that answer. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you again. And uh, to the audience, as always, thank you so much for joining today. Um, I, as always, I encourage you to continue your education journey in the passive investing space. But more importantly than that, I encourage you to make the decision to make that first or that next passive investment. I am confident that once you do so, you will wish you would have started much, much sooner. So thank you again for joining us and be sure to join us again next Thursday for another great episode. Thank you. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of The Gentle Art of Crushing It. It was an amazing episode. We know we sure learned a lot, and we hope you did as well. We want to take a second and thank you so much for viewing or listening to this episode. And please just know that we only ask for one favor, and that is to make this life magnificent. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.